Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome for the second day of the school. Um, so, hope many of you are still there with us. If it's the morning, the afternoon, um, we will have uh, our next talk that is quite quite important: it's version control and JIT. So, please uh, ask as many questions as possible because without this kind of knowledge, you will be very difficult the rest of the school. So. I will let uh, Maximilian to introduce himself, please. And um, I thank you again to, for being here. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Maximilian Noether. I have a slide with uh, who I am a bit later in, uh, in the talk. Um, so let's just start with version control using Git. Um, and I will just introduce a couple of um, yeah, general points about um, version control and, and why we need this for our scientific work and our collaboration on, on code. Um, Git is not the only version control system. Um, there are some precursors and some um, contemporary other programs that can basically do very similar things. But um, Git is, I think, the most powerful one and the one that is uh, most widely used. So um, we will be using that for um, yeah, for most of our work um, in, in software development and, and science. Um, so then I will go, uh, yeah, basically a, a deep dive into Git. Um, I will try to be as slow as possible when I do the live demo. Um, I will have the Slack channel open on my second screen. So um, when, I, when you think I'm going too fast or too slow, um, start spamming slow down or speed up. Um, there will be a bit of delay until I see it, but uh, I hope I can can manage to to find a good tempo for you. Um, and then the the first part will mainly be um, on on my computer or on your computer. You can um, try to play along, and then we also talk about the Git hosting providers. So these large platforms that uh, provide servers for you, so you can upload. Um, your Git repositories, you can work with other people, you have um, yeah, stuff like issue tracking and pull requests and so on. And that will be the um, yeah, third part of the lecture, um, which will be after the lunch break um, or the coffee break. I think it's a coffee break. Um, and then we will have the last part with some more advanced Git topics, um, like how do you change the history uh, after it has been written? How can you fix some, some common mistakes? and some of the more powerful tools that Git provides. So that's roughly the overview. Um, let's start. So uh, I'm a postdoc at TU Dortmund. Um, you can find my GitHub profile when you click on the link there. Um, I did my PhD in astroparticle physics um, yeah, last year. Um, I also had to, to have my defense under yeah, Corona. Uh, uh, not many people there, um, just the, the four professors in the room. So unfortunately a bit. Okay, but uh, the topic I am most concerned is this uh, gamma ray astronomy with imaging air Trenkov telescopes. Um, and I mainly work now for the Trenkov telescope array where I'm, I'm doing uh, data analysis using um, statistics, machine learning and software development. I'm one of the core developers of CTA pipe, the low level data analysis pipeline for analysis of the data of uh, CTA. Um, and technology-wise, um, I, I mostly focus on, on Python and C++, and I'm a, a big fan of, of LaTeX and uh, Vim, which we, we will see me use uh, in the hands-on session later. And I'm also a contributor to AstroPy and Map.lib. Um, and yeah, much like Rachel introduced yesterday, I'm also a big fan of uh, the free and open source software, this open science drive. Um, I think we will get there in, in a rather short time because it's getting so much traction. And I hope that really continues with this um, effort in, in that direction. And uh, I'm, I'm doing uh, lectures and um, workshops uh, where I mainly focus on, on uh, yeah, the development best practices for software. OK, so um, these are PDF slides, and you can find them from the link provided on the web page. Um, the LaTeX source code is actually in the GitHub repository, so you can build them yourself. Um, this is a warning that there's a lot of code on these slides and a lot of commands, and you might be tempted to copy those from the PDF files. Um, but this is a bit dangerous, especially for Python code, because um, you will lose most of the white space at the beginning of the lines. And it's not always 
um, the exact same code. And you know, for Python, white space is important, but also for commands, you you copy into your command line. So I would recommend to either if you copy some something from the slide stride from the uh, some of the example files I have in the repository, or type just type it by hand. And I would really recommend to you type it by hand because um, that's how you best learn how how to use these commands and um, yeah, just verify um, that what you typed is the same as on the slides, um, that it makes sense. And um, yeah, just don't try copying stuff just from, from the PDF slides. So um, first let's discuss um, version control in, in general and why we really need this um, to, to work productively together on software and to have reproducible open science. Um, version control by itself is just a system that tracks changes to a collection of documents. So you you have any any kind of documents you can imagine: software, legal documents, documentation, scientific papers, images, 3D assets of a game, um, whatever. Yeah, basically everything we work on over a prolonged period of time will immensely benefit from, from having version control. Because for example, if you make a mistake, you can just go back one iteration and, and go back to the working example. Um, or you can exactly know what, what happened two years ago um, when you had this one scientific paper and he used the software version from two years ago. Um, you can go back to that version and, and look at the code that was used for that paper. Uh, and um, one snapshot of such a collection of documents or of a software package is usually called a revision. So one um, point in time, um, the all the contents of this collection of documents we are talking about, this is called a revision. And then we can have a collection of revisions, and this is then our history of the project. And we have, um, yeah ordered revisions, so to say. So we can go, go back and forwards in time on this yeah, um, chain of revisions. And we need this, um, like I said, because we, we must be able to go to arbitrary revisions in the past that we used for some, some analysis, some paper. Um, we also need to to be able to view what changed between two revisions. So um, if if there is a bug, and we find out that it was introduced sometime in the past, we can can have a look at the difference between now and the software version back then, and that will help immensely in identifying um, yeah what might be the cause of this bug, for example. And um, the newer version control systems, and, and newer here means roughly the ones from the last 20 years, um, also have a big focus on, on enabling collaborative work. So that means, for example, most of these version control systems can, can merge the work of multiple developers. And if there are no conflicts, so no two developers edited the same line in a different way, this will also be merged automatically. So, so Git, for example, can can merge edits of two uh, developers that worked on the same file at the same time, as long as they didn't uh, edit the same line in, in an incompatible way. And even if they do that, it has a rather good way of, of showing you what the one person did and what the other person did. And then you can decide how to, to put this together. And most importantly, maybe um, it, it is a backup. So even if you're just working alone, um, use a Git repository. It's a local backup of, of your files if you just have it locally on your on your machine and you by accident remove the file and then you can ask Git to put it back or you make changes that don't work. It turns out you, you don't want these changes. You can just revert back to an older version of this file using Git. And in conjunction with the Git hosting providers, um, it, it is a real backup. Um, that is stored on, on servers somewhere else than your computer. Uh, and then you can just clone it back if you lose your computer and, and you have all your work back um, with all the history, all the changes that are part of this history. So um, the big features most of these version control systems have can be phrased basically in, in terms of the questions you can ask to the 
history of this project. So for example, a what question might be what changed from revision A to revision B and this, that's answered by, for example, using git diff to show the difference between two commits or two ranges of commits. Um, and that will just um, yeah, show you the difference exactly what, what is uh, changed between those two revisions. Uh, most of these version control systems also attach a lot of metadata to the uh, changes like um, the authors. So you can ask who made a change or if you want to look at the, the whole history of the project, um, you can, can ask who contributed to this project and you will get a nice list of, of people who contributed with number of commits and the time regions where they contributed and so on. Um, the, the arguably most important thing here is why. So um, a change of some code might not be obvious why this had to happen because code is complex um, in, especially in high level languages like, like C++ or Python. And it might, might not be obvious why, why this code had to change. Um, and, and code comments inside the code should only um, comment the current code. They should not elide to the history of the whole, whole line of code that, that we are talking about. So um, the version control systems encourage you or even force you to add explanation messages to your changes. And this is really crucial if you um, yeah, are looking for why something has changed or why something is the way it is. And obviously, um, the version control systems also encode the date or um, the commit range into those commits. And um, then you can ask a when question, when, in which revision was a bug introduced or fixed. And we will later even see a tool that lets you very efficiently find the exact commit where something broke or was fixed. So I, I think with this, I, I convince you that version control is really just the fundamental requirement for anything that has to do with software development and reproducible science. This is just a bare necessity. There's no way around it. You have, have to use it. Um, you can then talk about which system you want to use, but um, using no version control system basically isn't an option. So let's talk about Git and why um, at least currently or for the last like 10 years, Git um, is a most commonly used version control system. Uh, it was created by Linus Torvalds in 2005 because he wasn't um, happy with the precursors or the existing solutions back then anymore because the Linux kernel grew to a size where um, yeah, those older softwares really showed weaknesses in this collaborative aspect of working together. So they didn't manage to um, work well together with these thousands of contributors that the Linux kernel had at that time and still has. Um, so Linus Torvalds wrote his own version control system, which is Git. So um, the main, main, main um, improvement over the precursors are two things. So first you can use it offline. So when you, when you clone a repository, um, you get all the history locally to your computer. Um, precursors like SVN, for example, only have the current commit you're looking at checked out locally. And each time you want to look at a different commit, the different branch, an older version, you have to talk to the server again and get download the data. Not so with Git. So with Git, by default, you can get the whole history. It's stored efficiently on your disk and you can at all times, even without internet connection, um, check out other commits or other versions of the software. And um, to this uh, collaborative aspect of Git, uh, it has a much better branching model. Branching here means um, when multiple developers work on the same software there, they basically create different branches of the software. At, and these have at, at some point in time have, have to be merged together again to have one working software. So if, if many contributors work at the same time, it's crucial to have an efficient branching model that allows this to, to be rather lightweight um, and Git was the first version control system to, to introduce these lightweight uh, branching systems. Uh, on the left, there is a famous XKCD. Um, I, I probably give you like uh, a minute to, to read it. Um, so um, 
yeah, just read it. Uh, it's one of the yeah maybe prejudices or um, about Git that it's hard to use and you just have to memorize these shell commands uh, and you don't really understand maybe what's going on in the background. Um, but I, I hope that after the three hour lecture today um, with the break in between, um, this this comic doesn't apply to you anymore because you understand what you're doing now and you won't have to fall back as often to just removing the local project and, and clone a fresh copy. But the first um, sentence in this comic is actually important. So this is Git. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. Uh, and this is really at the core of Git. And this is what we will be talking about in the next couple of minutes, how, how Git really works um, on these histories, what, what a commit is, what a branch is, and, and how this all works together. OK, so let's start with the Git repository, which is like the central concept of, of Git. And um, this is basically just a directory on your local machine. So if we call Git in it, um, preferably in a new um, empty directory, but it could, could also be in an existing directory where you already have code, and then you can start adding this code to the Git repository. Um, Git creates a new repository. And, and what this essentially just means is that it creates this hidden .git directory in that directory and starts storing metadata about this repository there. And all the information Git is tracking um, is stored in this .git directory on your local machine. And, and that results in, in Git having three different areas where you, it can store data. So first, the, the most simplest one is just your current working directory, which you can see if you just open the directory in a file browser or do an ls in the terminal. This is what actually is stored on disk in that directory at the given time. And the other two uh, areas, the staging and the history, are basically stored in this .git directory and are yeah, so to say, privy to Git and, and not directly accessible um, with your file browser, but you have to use the Git commands to, to talk to these other areas or to migrate between those areas. And the staging area is, is called staging because um, in, in this area, changes that are safe to go into the next commit are, are stored. So this is basically a, a preparing the next commit. If you have made changes to your working directory, you edited a file, you edit a new file, um, you changed some code, you can add it to the staging area. And that means basically you, you mark it to be part of the next commit. And then if you do a commit, which is, um, yeah, Git's um, vocabulary for creating a new revision in the history, um, the, these, changes from the staging area will be moved into the history, which is all the commits that are were ever made in this repository, um, which form this tree model or a, a directed acyclic graph. Uh, and let's talk a bit about these, these words, directed acyclic graph, because um, these pop out in computer science all over the place and are a really important concept. So a graph just means you have some nodes that are connected by edges. Directed means these edges are basically arrows, so they have a they are pointing somewhere. And acyclic means you you don't have cycles. And forget this is important because directed means one commit is a node in this graph and it points back to its parents, and this gives us the time arrow basically backwards. So a commit points to its parent commit. And, and this is going then backwards in time. And acyclic basically forbids us to do time travel. Um, so we cannot have this grandfather paradox where a child depends, uh, where a parent depends on its child and the child depends on the parent. So we don't, Git forbids us to do this. We cannot do time travel in, in Git, or we can do time travel backwards in time and just look at it, but um, we cannot introduce these circular grandfather paradox um, dependencies. So we have these three areas. Um, and just to 
introduce you to the, the first two commands we can use. So if we want to put something from the current working directory into the staging area, we use git add. And then to make the next commit to put everything that is currently in the staging area into the history, uh, into uh, the history with git commit. And um, we will look at this into more detail after, after this general introduction when I start the hands-on demonstrations. Um, but but let's talk a bit about how, how this looks. So above you have uh, a simplified graph of commits, which is just one linear branch where we have added four commits, A, B, C, and D. And you see the arrows, they point back to their, their parents and we have um, the four commits in blue. And a commit is, like I said, just the state and content of our repository at a specific given time. And a commit always contains a commit message, um, which could be empty, but uh, I, I highly, highly encourage you to, to write meaningful commit messages. And what uh, good commit messages are, we will talk in, in detail a bit later. Um, so um, these arrows always point to, to the commit's parent. And there is the possibility that one commit um, has multiple parents. And this is exactly the situation when we want to merge uh, the work of multiple developers or of multiple branches together, then a new commit has two parents because we merge two um, yeah, different histories together. And these commits are identified by a hash. And here I choose a simplified A, B, C, and D, but, but Git uses a more complicated hash algorithm that we will see later. Um, that really identifies um, th this commit and it should be globally unique. So this hash function basically promises um, that your commit will not just be unique in your repository, but it will be globally unique to all Git repositories ever made. Uh, and this is um, done by, by hashing the content of the Git commit, the message, the author, the parents, and the time. Uh, the commit was made. And I, I think there's more information in there that is hashed, but these are the most important ones. Uh, the second big concept of Git are the branches. And we, I talked about this in a bit, um, but um, what, what makes branches so lightweight in Git is that they are only pointers basically to commits. We can have named pointers to commits, and these are branches for development. And um, uh, the situation got a bit complicated or a bit more complicated um, yeah, one or two, two years ago when there was a bit uh, or a large discussion um, about terminology and if it would be appropriate to use master-slave terminology in, in software. And um, yeah, basically um, the, the proposal was made to change the default branch name of Git to main instead of master and Git and Git that have now done this. So you will, in the wild, encounter repositories that have either the master as a default branch or main, um, and, and you just have to check. Um, and when we are on a branch, um, which we will see uh, in the demo uh, in, a, in a short moment, um, and you add a new commit, this moves, uh, moves along. So if we are on the main branch and add a new commit, the, the pointer will be, will be changed to point to the commit we just added. And here you can see, I, I will go back and forth a bit. So we created the second branch here, foo, and we added a, a commit to the, um, after the C commit, we added a second commit here, which is a CE commit. And this is on the branch foo. And um, the D commit is, is where the main branch is. And then if we go forward a bit in history, we see that on the main branch, there was another commit added. And then we have this merge commit that um, brings the history of these two branches together. The foo branch ceases to exist and we only have the main branch where we continue development. And this is uh, really the power of, of Git for collaborative work is this lightweight branching model with the ability to merge multiple branches back into the main development branch. Um, the last important concept is that you cannot just have these um, 
named pointers to a commit that move along, which are the branches, but you can also have fixed named pointers to a commit. Uh, and these are called tags uh, in Git. And these uh, are basically used for very important provisions. For example, uh, release versions of software. So you have uh, a version 1.0.0, which was the, the F commit. Um, and this could be anything. So you, you have a release version, you publish, or um, you have the software version that was used for a specific paper or the um, first version before you applied any corrections of, of the paper and then the version after the first round of reviewer uh, comments and then the final version. And, and these should all be versions that you can, can tag. Um, so you can easily find them afterwards. Um, yeah, so um, first let's uh, get this out of the way. So um, Git needs your name and email address because these two e uh, informations or pieces of information will be uh, part of, of each commit. So these are stored in the commit and um, you will get an, an, uh, a warning or an error message if you haven't set this yet for your local Git configuration. So if you want to play along, I, I would highly recommend to, to run this now. Um, please make sure to fill your own information. I have it regularly then when I give these lectures that people just copy uh, it from the examples and end up with something like uh, John Doe or, or my name in the Git configuration. So please make sure you, you fill your own information. And like I said, this is required for um, to making commits because this information is always required by Git to, to edit into the commit messages and uh, commit metadata. And um, if you are using GitHub or GitLab, it might make sense um, to use the same email address here or to add multiple email addresses to your profile because these hosting providers identify commits to the users um, by the email address. Okay, so now um, I will switch to uh, the demo part and I will start with just creating a new Git repository uh, and, and add some files and um, I will uh, encourage you to try to play along, um, but if it goes too fast for you, I would suggest to to not try to um, yeah make any any sudden changes or try to um, get back with the live demo, but just maybe um, try to follow the lecture instead of playing along. So um, if you get lost, uh, maybe maybe just stop doing things yourself and uh, and follow the lecture, I think this is more important than, than trying to really play along. Okay, so I have a, a nice little setup of terminals here. I will mostly work in the right pane here and use the other two panes um, to show live information about what is changing in the, in the Git repository. So I have a demo project here uh, and I will just make a new empty directory. I hope the, the font size is large enough. Um, and I will go into this directory and we can see that there's just a fresh directory, nothing is here. And if I do now git init, git says, okay, it's initialized a new empty git repository in this dot git directory. And if I now do uh, ls minus a, I can see there is this dot git directory here, but there's nothing else in this working directory. So it's still basically an empty directory with the exception of this new hidden .git directory here. What I can do now is I will just in this pane, I will um, run a command that will just keep um, the contents of this, oh, I'm in the wrong directory, uh, demo. That will just um, keep the view of this directory updated so you can see what I change um, during the, the live demonstration. And here I will um, show the Git history. So um, this currently shows nothing because we just created a new repository. But as soon as I will start to, to create the first commit, you will see the structure of the Git history here. Um, Max, uh, can you move your your camera uh, 
or so. It's uh, it's overlapping the code that the people are writing. Or I, I think I, I cannot do it, but maybe the the people doing the stream. Um, which part? The upper right part here? Or, yes. Uh, okay, I will try to. Uh, maybe I will just not use full screen and move it a bit down. Oh yeah, now now you disappear. Oh, I disappeared, so I can go back full screen? Yes. OK, nice. <laughs> so you will just see my screen and not my, my face, not, not to worry. OK. Um, so let's just, as a first step, um, what we probably always should do as a first step, add a readme file here. So I can just say this is the escape school 2021 live demo. And then, um, yeah, we will look at one of the most important Git commands, um, which is Git status. And this tells you basically what is currently going on in your repository. And it tells me now I am on branch main. I have no commits yet because I just created a fresh repository. And I have untracked files, the, the file I just created. And untracked means Git basically doesn't care about this um, this file yet because I haven't told Git to to do anything with it. So this is just um, yeah a new file that is lying around in this um, working directory. And to um, yeah edit to the to Git, I can do Git at this readme file and and I will do Git status again and we will see that this has changed. So we are on, still on branch main. We still have no commits. But now this file is not untracked, but it is in the changes to be committed. And this is exactly this, this staging area. So if I now do a git commit to create a new revision in the history of, uh, of my project, um, this change will be part of that commit. So let's do that, git commit. And this opens my editor. Um, it will, by default, I think, open Vim on, on most operating systems. And we'll later see how, how to change this to uh, if you don't want to use Vim. Uh, I don't know exactly what it will open on, on Windows if you're using PowerShell and don't have Vim installed. Um, you might, might want to try out what happens when, when you type git commit. Uh, and I will just, as a message here, say this is the initial commit at a readme. And then I can save and close this file. And this will result in the first commit in our history. So we have a new file, one file changed, one insertion. This is one line I edited. It created a new file in the Git repository. This is a message. And um, now here in this history view, we see the first commit and this here, this is this hash I was talking about, this unique identifier um, for all the commits we, we make. And this one is, um, yeah, this very complicated uh, number. But the nice thing about Git is you can just use the first couple of characters um, to uniquely identify the commit in your local repository. This will usually be enough. And then we see uh, this commit was made by me. Um, so here's the author and email information. I, I just mentioned we have the date and the commit message. So let's let's try to do some some more commits. Um, I will just create a Python file here. Um, we will see this example also in the testing and the packaging lecture. So let's just create a simple Python script that calculates Fibonacci numbers. Um, let's see. So if n equals zero, we return zero. If n equals one, we also return one. And then we do the recursion. So Fibonacci n minus one plus Fibonacci n plus uh, n minus two. Okay. Max, can you make the font size a little bit bigger? I, I just increase it a tad after I saw oh. the, the message. I, I don't know if it's large enough now. I can further increase it if it 
but then we get a bit of problem with the... I think it should be fine. I was just watching right. the YouTube stream, sorry. Okay. So, um, and that's, that's maybe just, if we execute this print some number, then we have some, some code we can work with. So maybe the, I don't know, 20th number or so. Oh, there's a typo. So let's try this out. We will see in the testing lecture how we can more systematically try out if our software works. Um, yeah, okay. So again, git status should show us that we have a new untracked file here, Fibonacci, exactly. So this is new and then we can do again, git add. And the status will have changed to that this is now a new file to be committed. Okay, so let's do that. Um, and instead of opening the editor, you can also give the message directly on the command line with the minus M switch. And you can just say, okay, add a Python module to calculate Fibonacci numbers. And we have the second commit in our repository. Can you tell us something about this text uh, file? S sorry, about what? <laughs> there is a text file in your directory. People are asking what it is. Oh, okay. So this is, um, we will come back to this later. So this is a file that my editor creates when I edit um, files. It, it basically has information about where functions and classes are in, in my code base. So I can jump to definitions. Um, and this is a file that I, um, I let Git ignore because it doesn't have to do anything with the software um, in the current, or uh, shouldn't have to be uh, included in Git. And we will talk about how to exclude such files um, later. Um, yeah, in a, in a few, few moments. So you should just ignore this file. Yeah, I'm sorry that I, I, I should have deactivated that functionality. Okay. Uh, the next interesting thing we might want to do is just use git show to look at the last commit or look at any commit if you give uh, a commit identifier as a second argument here. So if you do git show, we just get information about the last commit and we can see exactly what changed. We created this Fibonacci.py file um, and this was the content we changed. Um, we could also look at the initial commit. So if we do git show and copy or type the first, well, mostly should be, I mean, now it's should be enough to just write the four, uh, first letter here, but let's, let's write the first four here, dbe3. This will show what changed in the first commit here. So this was just the new readme with this line at the top. Um, and then you can, um, yeah, look at what, what these commits have changed. Let's go back to the slides for a moment. Um, so um, we just created a new local repository and, and played around a bit, created the first couple of commits. Um, most often you won't just create a new repository locally. Most often you will just um, download a repository from a server, for example, GitHub or GitLab. Uh, and this is what the git clone command does. So the git clone command, um, downloads an existing repository from one of these hosting providers. And you have all um, done this um, before, I think with the um, school repository. Um, maybe just let's, um, let's do this uh, again. So I will just go into a new directory and then git clone, and now we can add the URL of the school repository. And this will download this repository, um, put it into the current directory. So we have the school repository here. 
And then we can, for example, also do git status, which says we also on branch main and our branch is up to date with what is on the server and there's and we have not made any changes and we can also look at the git log and this is of course um yeah larger now because this is a school repository so you see i made some last minute changes yesterday evening to the git slides um and and all the other changes that that were made for example thomas fixed the the broken link here in the um in one of the the pages so we could also look at the exact changes here git show so how did he fix this okay so he put put the exact link um to this notebook uh, instead of this relative link here and that fixed it on the um on the website uh and like i said uh, all this information that Git stores locally about your Git repository that is not just lying around in, in the current directory is stored in this .git repository. So if you delete this, um, you basically erase all traces of Git, all the local history that you only have locally. Um, and, and then, um, yeah, basically, everything that Git knew about, about your repository is gone. And if you don't have the repository somewhere else, this is not recoverable. You will then just have what is currently in your working directory and not any history anymore. So we talked a bit about git status. Um, this is a really important command because it shows you what is currently going on, what you have uh, new files, modified, edit files. Um, you should call it really often just if you are uh, trying to git add or if you are um, preparing to do the next commit, um, just call git status. And what I um, find really handy um, is, is git status minus s. And I will, will show you this um, also here in, in our test repository. So git status minus s is a very short, concise summary. And if it doesn't show anything, that means I have no changes currently made. And then we could go to the readme and maybe just add a usage example here. So a um, bit of documentation from Fibonacci, import Fibonacci, print Fibonacci 10, maybe. And now if we do git status minus s, it says we have modified the readme file. And if you look closely, this is red here. Um, so this means it's not yet added. And if we edit, and do git status minus s again. This is now green and one column in the front. And that means this is in the staging area. And, and like this, you can get a very quick overview of which files you, you edited and, and what is um, what are the differences. Um, I said you can with git also easily show the differences between commits and different situations. And this is especially useful um if you make changes so let's commit this um add usage example to readme and this will create our third commit here in this repository um and now we can change something in the in the code again so let's see i i think this is way too slow because it's like the the most inefficient implementation of Fibonacci numbers you can think of. It's matching the mathematical definition, but written like this, it's really slow because you have this recursion. So we take like 0 0.26 seconds to just, uh, let's do some more here. Then it really shows. This should take a couple of seconds. Okay, so this is 2.5 seconds. Um, but we can apply a very simple trick to make it really fast. So we can just cache the results here. So we can from func tools import cache and just cache, cache this. And suddenly this is one of the most efficient algorithms to calculate Fibonacci numbers. And it just went down to 0.05 seconds. So 
let's let's see what we did differently here than before. Let's do git diff. And that shows what we changed. So we added these two lines here and changed this number here. And now if we add this, uh, the Fibonacci file, and do git diff again, it will be empty. Because git diff by default shows you the difference between the working directory and the staging area. And because we now have everything staged, we edit it. There is no difference between the working directory and the staging area, so git diff is empty. One of the most important and most helpful git commands is git diff minus minus staged. Um, so let's execute this from the top. Sorry. Git diff minus minus stage. And that shows you what is the difference between the last commit and the current staging area. And this is so powerful because this will be exactly what will be the next commit. So git diff minus minus stage shows you exactly what will be the changes um, when you type git commit. So let's do this. And then we have, oh, I made a typo. We will get later how we could fix typos, but this is one of the more advanced topics. So um, stay tuned for the, the second part of the lecture here. Um, and then, um, yes, so um, let's do also maybe the changes we made between multiple commits. So um, if you give git, um, Two, two commits here. So we can just look at what changed maybe between this version here and this version here. And then it will show a, an aggregate of all the changes between those two commits. So between those, those two commits here, we added this usage example in the readme and we added this, this cache, cache function. Nice. Okay. Okay, so we used git add. Um, I would always recommend you to, to add files um, one by one and not, um, not just add the whole directory or use uh, the, the switch that adds everything that has been changed. So think about what you want to add. This goes um, to what makes a good commit um, and not. Um, Git supports uh, moving and removing files um, and, and to automatically add this operation to the staging area. So you could do um, rename the file with the file browser or with MV with the MV command. Um, but then you had to would have to git add the old file name and the new file name. And this, this is just a handy short version for, for just renaming a file or removing a file and directly adding it. And if you add a file by mistake, you can use git reset um, to remove this from the staging area again. So we can also look at this, how this works. Um, so let's say I, I edit the readme again. Um, I don't know, just add a hello world here. My creativity with these live demos is somehow limited. Oops, I still have this file open. Um, and follow the style guides of Python by adding a new blank line here. OK, so now I have edited two files with two unrelated changes. Um, and let's say I just um, did the, the evil thing and just edited this, this whole directory and have have this both in the staging area now. But these are two unrelated changes. And the rule is you, you don't want to create um, or you won't, don't want to add unrelated changes to the same commit. So I can do git reset one of these files 
And then if I do git status minus s, I now see I have changes that are not staged in readme and only the Fibonacci changes are, um, are in the staging area. Let's look at this in the full git status. Okay, so still on branch main. Um, we have modified the Fibonacci and this is in the changes to be committed. And we have changes not staged for commit in the readme, but this is what we want. We just want to commit the, the first um, changes to Fibonacci. So um, fix coding style in Fibonacci. And then we can add the readme and say, uh, add hello world, okay. And like this, um, and like this, um, you get the the small changes, the unrelated changes in in one commit um, each, and not in in one commit together. Um, so this. Um, I showed and I saw in the Slack that there was already some confusion with how to exit from Vim or from Nano. Um, so you might want to change which editor Git is using for these commit messages. And um, the editor setting is, is here. So you can git config minus minus global core dot editor. And for example, this line is the correct line if you have VS Code installed to use VS Code for, for Git commits. And a simpler um, command line editor is, is Nano, where I also saw some, some people um, having problems. Um, but uh, you can just, uh, I mean, if you're not familiar with, with Vim, uh, I would, would recommend to, to put Nano here or your editor of choice. Um, you might have to Google what exactly you have to put in this option to make it really work with Git, so for example, VS Code needs this minus minus wait, so that that Git knows when you have finished edited to edit the the commit message. Um, Nano just works like this, and what's a bit uh, nicer about Nano than than Git is, for example, that it shows you the help how how to do stuff um, at the bottom. So uh, it's it's easier to for for new uh, people to maybe get used to it. Okay. So let's talk a bit more about what, what a good commit is. So um, yeah, like I stressed before with this simple example is that you um, should make commits for small logical units. So you shouldn't combine unrelated changes um, into one commit. And this is basically what, what you hear um, people say when they, they uh, what people mean when they say commit early and commit often. So a commit is not expensive. You, you can do very small commits very often and this is usually the way to go. Um, you shouldn't make too small commits um, either. So if you have uh, logical changes that belong together but are um, over several files, you shouldn't create one commit per file because it's really just one one change for example if you rename a variable that's used in or a function that is used in different uh, scripts that you have you should do it at the same time in one commit um, so just think about these um, logical units of of changes and um, like you have seen me do uh, it is a common convention to use imperative formulations for the commit messages. So you don't write, um, I added this file or I changed this file. You, you use an imperative change value of foo to six. Um, yeah, this is a very common convention and I would encourage you to use it. And for more complicated commits, and we will have a look at the Linux, uh, Linux kernel shortly, um, you should follow a certain style guide of commits. So uh, git, um, called the first line of a commit the subject, and you can give uh, a brief subject line, a brief description uh, summary of the commit here. And this should fit within 60 char characters to play nicely with, for example, how GitHub displays commit or how you can look at the log in the terminal. 
Uh, after that, you should leave a blank line, and then you can give a very detailed description of, of what you did. So for many of our projects, of our own works, this is probably um, will not be that big. But if you are working on, on complicated projects and have a, have a um, yeah, somehow delicate change to make, it, I would highly recommend to you to spend some minutes thinking about what you write into this commit message. And you can also, for example, uh, if you are co-working on the same computer um, or over Zoom or whatever, you are, are pair programming, which is also a practice I would highly recommend to you to try out. Um, you can add meta information at the bottom here that you um, work together with someone else. And then you give also this second author information um, in this classical name email um, style here. And this will result in, in GitHub um, also showing the, the second author, for example, for this commit. So let's look at the Linux kernel because usually you can um, yeah, identify great commit, how you write great commit messages um, when you just look at some commits here. So the Un Linux kernel is a huge project. It, it's going on for nearly 30 years now. Um, it has in the Git history, 1 million commits, over 1 million commits. Um, so several years ago, uh, GitHub just um, displayed infinity contributors because they couldn't handle the large numbers. They fixed this, it seems. So it's now 5,000 plus. But if you see it there, like, yeah, okay. So it's more like 12,000 contributors. So we have 12,000 people over the whole history of this project working together on this. We have 700 releases and and like I just said, one over 1 million commits. So um, if you look at this, uh, the contributors here on the GitHub page, the history of, of Linux um, starts in 2002 when it was migrated to, to Git. Um, and then we have this development history here and you can see who contributed the most. Um, there's a funny thing that some people contributed negative amount of code. So this guy here removed in total 600,000 lines of code from, from the repository. And, and this guy here removed 900,000 lines of code. Um, I think this was when they removed support for certain hardware platforms and they just removed a bunch of drivers at the same time from the Linux kernel. They removed hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Okay, so let's just peek into one of the commits here and I'm not using one of the merge commits, but maybe um, one of, of these here. Okay, so this for, for Linux terms is a rather short commit message, but um, you see that they basically in detail discuss what they did um, and they add this, this meta information, what issue they fixed, who looked over the commit and made the code review and, and who approved it for, for being merged into the Linux kernel. Okay, so um, you saw the git lock um, on, on my left screen. So let's look at this again um, in the normal version, not at this in this version I, I show in the live demo. And then we can also look into um, commit ranges or into this one line form of, of commits. So this should is essentially show the same as on the left, just without these um, decorations I added, um, which we will see in a moment. Um, and, and this is just, you can scroll through the history here. And with Q, you can get out. Um, and then we could just look at commits between certain commits. So let's say we want to go from, um, from the newest commit or from, from this commit here. And then we add two dots to this commit and this will give us just a, a part of the history. And I think I have to invert the order here. Uh, a, a, e. oh, one. Okay, yes. So I had the wrong order first. So you have to give the older commit first and then the newer commit second. 
and then you get only the log for, for the commits in between these two commits here. So the first one, um, yeah, that shows this. Um, and if we want to have a more concise version, we can add the minus minus one line switch, and then we just get um, a very concise, uh, the abbreviated hash first, and then the first line of the commit message only. Um, and um, yeah, you can add more options to what, what shall be displayed here. So you can force it to show the dates, but uh, if you're interested in this, you can try to find this out. Git has a very um, extensive documentation. You can also access from the terminal um, using these man pages. Um, and you can just look at it and see if what else it can do. Um, I would highly recommend to you to get uh, accustomed to reading those man pages to find out, out stuff. Um, the view I have on the left side is uh, running this command here, where it shows all the branches, which will get interesting as soon as we talk about branches. And um, it shows a graph, which basically draws the line between the commits and it decorates um, using the, the current branch names. And what is also interesting is this short lock. Um, short lock is, is useful, for example, to prepare releases. And this shows you um, the, the commits by author or the number of commits by author. So I will go into um, another project here, or maybe it's a school repository. And if I do git, git short lock, I will see um, the commits by author. So there are the commits by Arturo, by Rachel, by Eduardo, and Enrique. Um, and, and this can be used, for example, to um, prepare change blocks for releases. Um, or I can just do um, the minus n switch, and then it should just uh, minus sn, and then it will report the number of commits for each author. So this is very helpful um, for preparing commits when you want to, to um, acknowledge who contributed. If I go to a more complicated or more, um, yeah, uh, an, an older repository with more history, for example, the CTA pipe software I'm working on, um, you could, for example, ask um, who contributed between um, two versions. So between version 0 0.6, for example, and version uh, 0 0.11. OK, and then you can see who provided or who contributed to this, this project. We also, during the live demo, already did git diff. So I will just skip this here. Um, you can, can look it up if you want to, to go through the slides again. So we have used these three commands to look at the difference between um, two commits between the current working directory and the staging area. And uh, because it's so, so very useful, I will stress this again. So git diff minus minus staged, run this before you do git commit because it will exactly show you what changes you will be adding to this commit um, if you if you are working on a project and make a new commit, run this, check if it's what you are expecting to see, and if not, use git reset or, or git add to, to add more changes or remove the changes you don't want to, to commit. Um, yeah, but really, really highly recommended to run this command before you do git commit, because then you will see what exactly will happen in the commit. So um, I said it's possible to go back in history, and this is basically what this is about. So we can use git checkout to uh, load a commit from the history into the current working directory. And I will, I will demo this um, uh, in a second. Uh, and we can also restore versions of files um, from, from older commits using this git restore command. Um, either you restore it from the last version, uh, or you can also restore it from a specific version in time using this source option. Okay, so first, 
let's say I want to look at the repository, um, how it was when I first started working on it, on this Fibonacci stuff. So let's do git checkout and 2C FE18. And um, yeah, so the lock should change now. Oh, I, did I 2C? Oh, I missed the E. OK, and it says something that's rather concerning. Uh, you are now in detached head state. So somehow I lost my head. Um, this just means I'm not currently on a branch anymore. You can see here in this decorated um, view that the main branch still points to the latest commit here. But the head, so what is currently checked out in, um, in the in the working directory is, is this commit here. And if I now um, look into the file, it will basically be the older version before we made all those changes. See, so the, the caching is gone and we are really at this, this version here. And if I go even further back in time to the initial commit, so to this DB, this one here, git checkout. Then you will even see that the, the file is gone here. So the, the Fibonacci.py uh, is, is gone because at this version of the repository, it didn't exist. And I can go back to, to my main branch to the latest commit with git checkout again. And then the head is again at the main branch position in the latest commit and the Fibonacci.py is back in um in the version we have here with with this caching and the 35 so this is how you can um uh how you can um go back in time using git one more thing um is this git restore and um Maybe you make changes you didn't intend to do. And um, I think this question came up yesterday, how if you ran Jupyter notebooks and you, you essentially changed them um, unintentionally because just opening the notebook will, will change it, um, how you can go back to the version that you have uh, in the repository. So let's just add something here, uh, foo. Um, I look at git diff, so we added this git foo, git status minus s. Okay, so we modified the readme. And this is a change I want to just discard. I don't want to, to keep it. I, I made it by mistake. Um, I want to go back to the, um, the version I had in the last commit. And this is what git restore can do. So I can git restore the readme, and this will discard these changes. So if I now do git uh, the readme, this foo is gone, git diff is empty, and git status minus s is also empty because I reverted the changes I made to the readme to the last commit. Uh, and these changes are now basically gone. So this is also not really recoverable. If you restore a file, your local changes will get lost. And this is mostly exactly the reason why you use git restore, but it also might uh, of course, destroy your work when you restore a file by accident. So be careful with that. And with that, we could try to um, go back to the school repository and maybe um, run a Jupyter notebook. Whoops. Jupyter notebook. Uh, for example, in the notebooks lecture. So let's execute the cells and this will for sure um, yeah, change these notebooks. And if I like enter a new line here, this will also change it and, and run this again. Um, all these numbers change and, and then we can look at the 
the git diff here, which will look, look basically horrible. So I, I shut down this. And now if I do git diff and I type it correctly, oh, I didn't save. <laughs> okay, try it again. I have to save. Didn't give it a chance to save. Okay, so just running this and running this again, the number changes, I save, it saved. I close the notebook. Shut down the server and now I should have a git diff. Yeah, for example, this execution count here changed and the version is slightly newer and, and things like this. Um, git status minus s tells me that I, I modified this notebook and now I can just git restore the notebook path and then the diff is gone. And this also means I can git pull now. Okay. So um, a quick note, um, I don't know if it happened to you, but um, some of you might, might be on uh, systems with a very old version of Git and these older versions of Git don't have Git restore because this is a relatively new addition to Git. Um, it was added because Git checkout could do too many things and that was very confusing. It could um, change the commit you're currently looking at, it could change branches, it could create new branches, it can could do this restoring or it, it still can because it, they, they didn't remove this functionality. But to make it a bit more easy to um, yeah, to, to navigate those complicated git commands. They added two new commands that are simpler to use, um, which are git restore and git switch, um, which, we'll, which we will see in a moment for, for the branch. So if you are on an old version of git, um, you can, instead of this git restore uh, minus minus source and the file name, you can use this version of a git checkout call. So the dash dash makes sure git interpret interprets what comes here as a file and what comes before as a commit or a branch name. Um, and then this does basically the same thing as git restore minus minus source. Okay, so for the last part now before the break, um, we will talk about git, git remotes. Uh, and git remotes are the servers where you can upload and download repositories like GitHub or GitLab. Um, and you basically have two more commands now um, to um, publish your changes to the server or to download the changes from the server into your own local history. Um, yeah, so let's let's see how we can can do this. So the first and easiest step you can of, of course do to talk to a um, repository on a remote server is uh, to use git clone. Uh, and we, we did this now several times already. Um, you can add a new remote to a repository with the command git remote add, and then you have to give it a name and the URL, which would be the same URL as um, for, for GitHub if you create a new GitHub repository. And there's a convention that this default remote should be called origin. So um, if you just have one server you want to talk about, you should name it origin. And when you clone a repository, uh, Git will set up this origin remote already. So if we just look at, at this cool repository again, Git remote to list the remotes, uh, it says here the origin remote is um, this, um, yeah, this uh, GitHub repository and, and it's the same address for fetching and pushing, so for uploading and downloading. If we go to our repository for the live demo, we don't have any remotes because we created a local new Git repository and didn't add any remotes yet. So what I will do now is I will go to GitHub and create a new repository. Uh, in my namespace, and we'll just call it escape 2021 git demo. This can be a public repository. 
Um, and because I already have a local Git repository, I don't want to uh, do any of these initialization steps here. We will talk about this a bit later, um, but GitHub uh, allows you basically to create the new repository already on GitHub and add a readme file with a short description and a git ignore and a, and a license file. Um, live demo repository at escape escape 2020 school 2021 create this repository and git is so so friendly to um to give or github is so friendly to give me also directly the needed um the needed commands to add this so uh, we have a repository so we uh we can use this. So push an existing repository from the command line. We just need to add um, the the origin or the remote origin here with the correct URL. Um, this is here um, to make sure that the default branch is named main, which is the new default on GitHub. We don't need this because we directly started out uh, with main, and then we can git push um, this to uh, the new repository. So I will just copy this here. And execute it. So we now have our remote origin. And for the first time we push a new branch, we have to say where to push it and that we can do with the minus u origin and the branch name. So I have to enter my credentials to push to GitHub. And then it uploads um, to GitHub. And we should immediately see this in our browser. If we refresh here, we have the readme and the Fibonacci.py. And GitHub nicely displays this readme here um, in the browser. So uh, if you are on a branch that is already pushed, um, at least once, so it is now into the remote, you can just use git push again to add a new commit. And like you saw before, if you uh, upload a branch for the first time, you need to say where to push it. So um, even if you just have one remote, you still have to say that you want to use that one remote. Um, and this is what this minus u origin does when you push the new branch. So let's just add a new commit and, and try to push it. So okay, get at get commit. And now the commit here should appear. And if you don't now do git status, it will also say that our branch is one commit ahead of origin main. So um, we have one more commit than is on the remote. And if we do git push, which is also says here, um, we can upload these commits, git push. And then we can check back and refresh here. And then this was updated. And we can also, for example, look at the git block here. And we see all our commits. Um, and this one was just made one minute ago. So this brings us to our typical single branch workflow. Um, and the, the first step is, of course, here to, to get your hands somehow on a repository. Um, you uh, either create a new local repository with git init, or you, um, you clone an existing repository from, um, from a remote location, from GitHub or GitLab, for example, using git clone. 
Um, if the repository exists, you do a git pull, which is a combination um, of git fetch to download all the changes and immediately get them into your current branch. Uh, and then you work, you edit the files, you build your software, you test it, um, and then you can do the usual git add and git commit and how, however often you like. And then uh, maybe I can ask one of the other tutors to um, to make a commit here to demonstrate this. So I will just give Tamash access here. And maybe he can quickly push, uh, this is a bit surprising now, maybe he can manage in time um, to add a new commit to demonstrate what happens if someone else is uh, faster than you pushing another commit. Um, so th the rule is if there are commits on the remount you don't currently have, you have to update first. Um, and this means you have to do git pull and this will get the newest changes from um, the commit and uh, from the remote, sorry. And, and this might um, also create conflicts, which we will talk later about how to resolve these conflicts when they pop up. Um, and then after you integrated your changes um, with these changes from the, from the server, you can upload your own changes with, with git push. And then you start back at one, you edit the files, you, you keep on working, and then you can at some point continue committing uh, and pushing. Um, so um, the the power of Git truly shines uh, as soon as we start using uh, more commit uh, more branches than just one. Um, but I think we are at ten twenty three now. So um, maybe um, I will leave this um, for the second part of the lecture and make here an early. Um, break for questions. So we can have questions in the in the first section here and then start with the multi-branch workflow uh, or working with branches um, as the first part of the second part of the lecture. I just posted. Ah, nice, thanks. So let's let's do this and then go to the questions. So you have some time to, to catch up with the questions. So if you now look here on the GitHub commit page, there should be a commit by by Tamas, and he's equally creative as me. He just added a new foo file in uh, in this directory, and so I let's imagine I didn't yet see this, and also added a new file bar git add bar git commit add bar, and now I want to git push. And then I get this um, this error message here. Um, git failed to push some refs to this repository. And this is really an, an encouragement to you to, to read those messages and try to understand them. So git is very verbose by default um, and will explain why things happened. And it might not make sense to you immediately, but try to to read those messages from, from top to bottom and try to understand what it means. So hint, updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same ref. You may want to first integrate the remote changes. And this is exactly what happened. So uh, this another repository here is, is Tamas local repository, which added another commit. And we don't have this locally because we didn't git pull. Okay, so, um, and git even tells us use eg git pull before pushing again. Okay, so let's do this git pull. And then we now have um, Thomas commit here and, and my commit here. Um, and I can now, now push myself. And, and this is how this 
pull first and then you can push yourself uh, approach usually works in the single branch workflow. So um, be committed to the same, same branch. Um, Tamash was a bit faster than me. So I have to pull first because uh, before I can, can push my own commits. Okay. So um, are there any questions I, I should address from the Slack? I, I had it open, but- I, um... I, will, I will help you with that, Matt. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for the, for the presentation. Um, yes, I have some and, and try to put it together because they are correlated. So, so essentially there is a, couple, a few questions about commit. So I try to put it together more than one. It says, what is a commit? How you can you know, imagine that? Uh, or put it in, in, in a more graphical way. Um, and if there is any rule of the thumb or how frequently you should do it, no? Uh, <clears throat> yes, so uh, you can imagine a git commit just as, as a snapshot. It's basically one snapshot, how your working directory looked like at, at one point in time. It's just a, a version of, of the, this repository directory that is saved forever in the Git history. Imagine it as a, as a snapshot uh, at a certain point in time of, of your software, together with the other information like the commit message and who did the last change that led to this version of the software. And um, I, I think I, I went into quite a few details about uh, how, how frequently you should commit. And I, I think it's not, not really about time frequency. It's about these logically contained changes. So if you are trying to resolve a bug, you might, you might work a week on it or two weeks on it. And in the end, it will be a one line change that is one commit. So you have one commit in two weeks, which is a small logically contained unit. If you work on, a, on something new, you might, might be just going away and and uh, are very productive and you will make a new commit every five minutes because you're in the flow and you're writing software. So think about these logically contained set of changes that should go into one commit, not not in, 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 in the time domain, in the semantic uh, domain of, of your changes that should go into a single commit. Thanks. Um, and more or less in the same, again, the commit part was obviously quite important. So uh, people ask, for example, if we, you need to be in a, a particular place inside the JIT repository directory, let's say, to do the commit, or you can do it wherever you are. And, you have uh, to, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yes, oh, sorry. You, have to, uh, you have to be inside the repository, um, but you don't have to be in the base directory of the repository. So if you have subdirectories in your, um, in your GitHub, uh, in your Git repository, you, you can also commit from one of these subdirectories. You don't have to be in the in the base directory where the .git folder lives. Git will look for um, a .git um, directory um, By the way. Uh, in in the current or in any upper directory. Okay, and this is more uh, you know a convention also, but uh, somebody asked. Um, how do you should end your commit message? You know, you are working in, a, as you mentioned before, in big collaboration, it's just, it's not only your project. So there is some kind of, you know, etiquette that you can, and how you write your, your commit message if you finish with a, you know, with a dot or not. <laughs> okay, so that's really detailed about typography in, in Git commit messages. Uh, I, I would say the, the punctuation doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. but you should stick to this uh, a concise headline that really says what the commit is about and then give details, um, maybe using bullet point lists or uh, linking the respective issues. We will talk about that later, um, how you can also discuss issues in the commit messages and so on. Okay. Um, yeah, but but this stick to this concise headline and then a more detailed description below. That is really important because that's Git's and GitHub's assumption about how your commit messages look and it will make it display nicely uh, in the command line and on GitHub. Okay, thanks, yes. Um, there was another question related to when you were setting who you are, no? 
the fact in, in JIT. They said there is a way to mim um, according to what you are saying, can you mimic being a different author by using the same name and a different email address or someone else? Yes. And how um, did you prevent this if it's not the case? Sorry. So um, I can just do git minus c user.name equals uh, Toma, and I'm probably butchering his last name. You can use my name, uh, Max, if you want, because my commit is signed. So Ah, right. Tamash Gal and himself. Uh, minus c user.email. And this is uh, Tamash Gal. At yeah, you can use whatever you want. Like this? Uh, I actually use my himself at tomashgal.com, but to make it exactly the same. As ah, OK. Platform. So it's himself at? And then my name without space, dot com. Ah, yes. And I have to make a, a change. So let's just go here and touch. Uh, we were at bar, right? Foo bar. So the next one is but. I saw a question about this as well. So get at bus commit uh, or oh, I missed an equal sign here at bus and now you see that this is really happening as as Tamas Gal um, and not as me because I overwrote these properties here on the command line. And this is of course an issue and there's uh, a cryptographic solution for this. So you can use GPG keys to sign your commits to really make sure um, that, that the information um, in the author um, information is um, what it claims to be. But yes, you can just... Okay. Um, impersonate someone else and the only way to really prevent this is to to sign your commits using this cryptographic methods um, using gpg keys and github actually also verifies this so if you now push and compare the two commits you should be able to see the difference between a signed and an unsigned uh, a verified and unverified commit uh, sorry for changing so quickly Oh, see, so it doesn't, oh, sorry. Uh, it, it even displays your username for the commit I did. And these two commits here are verified either because you set this up locally or be because you used the GitHub interface to actually make the change. Um, I, I set it up on the, on, the, on the terminal, so it's automatically ah, okay. done. Yeah. Um, but uh, I actually don't have um, have this in the lecture. So there's a good documentation about this on, on GitHub, I think, which you can follow to set this up. Um, yeah. OK. No, but I mean, the point is, at the end is that you can do it, and uh, there is ways to prevent it. So yes. Uh, yeah. So thanks. There is another question that is quite uh, can be relevant also for the students now and, and in the future is that, especially working with the Jupyter Notebook, you know that the Jupyter Notebooks uh, when you are versioning through JIT, uh, they will show you changes, even if you just, just run it, no? and you yes. don't do a real change. Uh, so the, the, the reinterpretation of the question is, do you have a weight or? Uh, yes, actually, I have a slide about this in the up. second part of the lecture. So I will Perfect. discuss some limitations of Git and, and Jupyter Notebooks will feature in this. And I have some workarounds you can, can use with Jupyter Notebooks to make it work nicer with, with Git, yeah. Excellent, so that, uh, that means that Guys, you have to come back, of course, after the break. <laughs> um, and also, people ask if it's always required to work on the terminal or this uh, way to, you know, to work in a more, I would not say friendly, but uh, a graphical way. Uh, so um, I'm of the opinion that before you should use those um, GUIs or editor integrations, you have to understand what it's doing in the background. And the only way to understand it is is by using its command line interface to to understand what it's really doing behind the scenes. Um, as soon as you are, have understood that and can use it confidently, you you can look into um, what what GUIs are there for Git, how you can use use GitHub, or how your editor of choice um, also integrates with Git. So, um, for example. Um, 
I have have a Git integration in my editor here. So if I, for example, you will see that there are, are green crosses popping up here where I, I put new lines in, in Git. Um, and I could Git commit from inside um, my editor. But I think you, this are um, yeah, things you, you should only try to use after you really understood how, how Git works. And because this, I, I regularly encounter situations where people really shoot themselves in the foot by, oh. by using um, yeah, Git GUIs without really understanding what happens in the back. Thank you. Thank you. So I will leave you the last one. So before you don't go too far into the break and uh, come back, obviously we will have more questions. How do you define the, say, the difference between the JIT fetch and pool? Uh, again, just to clarify yeah, I, some of this into the chat. Yes, so um, we will come back to this also in the second half because I have another slide on this. But essentially, um, Git pull does first a Git fetch and then a Git merge. So Git pull is, is a um, nice convenience method to, to first do a Git fetch to download all the stuff and then do a Git merge to get the uh, changes from from the downloaded repository uh, into your current branch you are working on. Okay. So again, it will be more in the second half. So thanks again for all the for all the insights, for the graphical view. The people was loving it, uh, obviously, how you were working at the same time, seeing what is happening in the back end, let's say. So thanks also for, for that. Um, so yes, we will come back. Uh, sorry, I miss myself my windows uh, at 11 so in 23 minutes let's say uh see you everybody here again thank you so much and don't forget that you can join the garden during the coffee breaks See you.